and then gallery view. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming from around the world. It's great to see you guys. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are staying safe in uh, quarantine. Um, hope you guys are wearing your masks. And, and uh, uh, I, I hope everyone's um, working from home okay, studying from home okay, graduating from high school and going into uh, 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 new grades okay in quarantine. But um, it's great to have you here. And uh, I'd like to welcome our guest today, uh, Pedro Boli. Hello. Pedro. Hey, Pedro. Hey. I've known Pedro for 35 years. Um, no, <laughs> I, I've known him for a little over six months. But when I met him in the beginning, I think it was at a uh, development happy hour. And he was just the, the coolest, nicest, humblest um, uh, artist uh, in development. And um, I remember first seeing his work. And remember that, Marcel? Uh, just like, um, I, I remember just seeing your work and just going, this guy is, has like the funniest drawings in the world. I am so jealous of how oh great God. and funny his drawings are. I mean, like they're caricatured and they're pushed, but they're really based off of real uh, observations and real experiences that, and people that you kind of felt like he'd seen in life. And I'm just like, how does he do it? I'm jealous, I hate this guy. And then you meet him and he's just the nicest guy in the world. And then you're like, I love this guy. Uh, it has to be, oh, like, when you're looking at really good designs, it has to be, um, uh, there has to be a freshness to it. Like you want to see some, like uh, something new, something fresh. I know a lot of people, a lot of young people want to, you know, emulate something. But uh, if you're emulating, it, uh, somebody made a great statement a long time ago, and they said, if you're, if you're just trying to get even, you'll never get ahead. And I think that that's, uh, that's sometimes, you know, not just socially, but sometimes like professionally, if, if you're trying to copy a look, let's say you're coming up right now in, in your talent and you're developing your talent and you're trying to copy someone that by the time that you get to the spot where you're going to be doing work, that that style is going to be passe. That style is, you know, it's already hit its peak when you're getting interested in it. And so it'll last a little longer and then it's going to go away. So it's important to be authentic. And Pedro has that. Pedro has that authenticity. It's funny. It's authentic. It's charming. It's just, just brilliant stuff. Oh, thank you so much, guys. You guys are amazing. I, you are all my heroes. Uh, I, I, I've, I've known I've known of you guys way before I was at Disney. Uh, I remember walking the halls and seeing Bobby's name on the on the next to the office. I'm like, is this like is this the actual? Bobby Pontillas and this. <laughs> it's the imitation. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, it's very overwhelming and very uh, uh, intimidating too. But then, like Bobby said, you meet these people and they're like just the nicest folks on the planet. So it, it feels, I felt very welcome, very invited from day one. You guys have been amazing, even though you're all legends. Man. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I literally like, this is, when, it, I, when I went to pitch for Disney, I, I thought we were pitching the executives, uh, and then, you know, I, I saw on the invite that one of the executives was Shane uh, Fridmore, and I, my reaction was like, can we just hide my drawings and not put, <laughs> put any drawings on the table when we pitch, because I am, I'm sweating bullets here. So, and, and when, after, and after the meeting, after he came over and he just, like gave me the nicest compliments on on the material. I literally choked up and like teared up. Oh <laughs> so, man! So it's so come amazing. on. It was. This is gonna be guys. This is gonna be the whole panel. This is us gonna be complimenting each other. And go, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you. No, you. No, you. Uh, no, I promise. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I. Uh, but you know, I, I think that does speak to the, like when you're in the industry, when once you get in the industry that, um, uh, and, and you meet other artists, that it, it takes a lot of effort to, to get really good. And I think that what happens is that when you finally arrive, that you, you realize that everybody has that mutual respect for each other because they know how hard it is. Right. You know, they know the dedication that it takes to get there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's wonderful. Oh, and the other aspect is that by the time you get to, you know, a major studio, 
that uh, a lot of a lot of these other um, or a lot of these artists they've come from all these different studios they've come from all these different places in the world and when they and when they come together they've already learned how to get along they've already learned how to uh, cooperate with each other and and that's why you run into like hey these are really wonderful people because you know yeah. animation is a it's a team sport right, right. Yeah. you got to you got to play on a team yeah if you can't if you can play on a team you, you have no business working animation cuz <laughs> right you can do it yeah. alone well you, you can but i i think it's important to work in uh, freelance that you have to know yourself if like some people they just have a really hard time uh, working with other people, they have a hard time taking um, uh, direction, uh, and sometimes it, it's best just look, just do freelance work and then send it out, and then not interact with anybody. Hire an agent um, yeah. that that can negotiate for you. You have to know yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's that's good to go. I I, I think uh, we're two hundred strong now. Two boom, two hundred strong. So I uh, just wanted to give a brief introduction for. Our Anyone that doesn't know Pedro, um, he is a Brazilian Canadian. No, Brazilian. I worked in Canada for, for a couple of years. Ago. Okay. Braz Canadians on the internet. Uh, Brazilian animator, director, writer, producer, storyboard artist, and voice actor. What? Because he could just do. Do you not read your own Wikipedia voice description no, voice? on no. the internet? No. I, am, I am a. Take a look at it. I, I am a terrible voice actor. I have, uh, when I was doing my first, my first show in Brazil, I was like, oh, I'll do like a tertiary character. Yes, I'll do it. And I hated it and I regretted it. <clears throat> I hate hearing my own voice. I have not cut out to be a voice actor. I will never be one of those show creators who, who cast themselves it's, ever. That's, 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 so funny because I, that's so funny because I love your voice. And it says that you're a soap opera actor in Brazil. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, and I was a teen. I was a teen star. I was one of the Menudos. Uh, Ooh, I loved Menudo when I was young. That dated myself, but I, I did. I got to get your autograph and some dance uh, lessons afterwards. Um, so, <laughs> Pedro is the creator of Cupcake and Dino for Netflix right now. And right now, it's on Netflix. Uh, yeah, oh. it's on Netflix and now on, yep. and it's on Disney XD in some countries. Oh, that's um, awesome, man. So. Um, uh, Ollie's pack on, on Nickelodeon and yeah. Oswaldo, your first one on Cartoon Network. Yeah. So you, you must be, this is a mansion that you're living in now. Um, oh, and, no. and is, <laughs> is currently, Pedro is currently, he only, he, he only uh, created and pitched and sold three shows. So clearly he's, he's slacking off in life. Um, and, and, and is currently, uh, at Disney television animation. Um, so, uh, welcome again, Pedro. Uh, so it's great to have you here, man. Marcelo, just impromptu co-host. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of just wanted to start out because it's called, you know, um, you know, from Brazil to LA and my journey into show running, um, I guess, you know, without getting, you know, too into the weeds of it. Um, and I'm interested too. Um, I mean, where in Brazil did you grow up, man? I grew up in Rio. Oh, okay. I've heard yeah. of that. Yeah. I've only lived in cities where, like, I feel like most people heard of. <laughs> I grew up in Rio, and I lived for, like, 10 years in Sao Paulo. Okay. So, okay. Got it, got it, got it. Easy. And so you were born, <laughs> born, born and raised? Born and raised? Born and in, raised in Rio. And then when did you move to Sao Paulo? Uh, I moved to Sao Paulo for my first animation job. Oh. So, uh I guess to give a little bit of background, I, I, I went to college in the, in the distant year of 1999, and uh, I did, took uh, advertising in college, which was, which at the time, like especially in Brazil, there was no like, animation was not something that was just like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to animation college and be an animator. It's just, it's not a thing, it doesn't exist. So, I, I had these like creative urges. I, I really like to draw and I really like to write. And, and I was like, okay, the most creative thing I can do in Rio in the 90s was like advertising and work in like, because they have a department called the creative department. It had agencies. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I so kind of halfway through college, I got my first job. I worked in advertising for five years. 
I was a copywriter. I had nothing to do with visuals or anything. I, I used to write the ads. Uh, and after five years, uh, my soul was sucked dry uh, by advertising. And it's like writing puns for toothpastes and stuff like that. Oh, no. uh, just kind of like oh, did, no. didn't really feed the urges that I had. Uh-huh. And so, and so I, I quit my job. I had saved up some money and I went to Canada for the first time to Vancouver and I, I studied a year at Vancouver Film School and back at the time I was like I'm I'm very old I was like 26 which at the time felt very old <laughs> and, and I was like okay I have no time to waste I studied at VFS for a year and did the classic animation program which it's kind of a very intensive program but you kind of you kind of get as much as you put in. So if you put in a lot, you get a lot back. Uh, but at the end of the day, even as much as you put in, it's one year. So you learn enough to kind of get your, get started on the industry uh, as maybe an assistant or something like that. So uh, after that year, I've applied for jobs in Canada and because of the whole work visa situation, I had like two offers, but could, didn't have like a substantial enough offer to apply for a visa. So I, at the time, I was like, oh, shit, I have to go back to Brazil. What am I going to do? I don't know what the animation industry is like in Brazil. I don't even know if they have one. I think this is, must have been really responsible of me to do, like, go take an animation program. Uh, so I was like, okay, I was really scared. Went back to Brazil. Applied for a couple of studios in Brazil that uh, were around. Brazil had one show at the time, uh, one animated show, and, which was like a preschool show. Uh, and I was really lucky that the studio in Sao Paulo, Fabordo, which at the time was a very, very small two studio, it was literally five people, uh, hired me to uh, work for them. And so I worked there for 10 years. During those 10 years, the studio went from five people to like 70, 70 something people. Uh, and uh, in the first few years of the studio, I was lucky enough that I got to do a little bit of everything because the, all the projects were really small. It was like, it was like commercials and uh, you know, the music video was like the longest thing we would do like in terms of running time. So most stuff was like 30 seconds. So I got to, so each project we, I would, I would be in a different position. So I got to animate on one project and then do character design on another one and do boards and eventually do some directing. And it was, it was like such a great experience to be able to dip your toes into different parts of production. And that's something I feel like I really benefited from being in Brazil. Uh, for sure, if I stayed in Canada working on like TV shows and stuff, uh, there's way more of a set path of like, okay, uh, I apply for to be an animator. I'm going to be an animator and then, you know, like senior animator and then animation director. There's much more of a like, a, you know, singular, singularly focused path. Right. So doing a little bit of everything means I am not like particularly great at any one thing. Like I'm not, I'm not a really good at, I'm not a great animator. I'm an okay animator. I'm an okay ish board artist. I feel like I'm a pretty good character designer. Like that's the thing that I kind of gravitated the most towards that I really am passionate about. Uh, but I think having a little bit of those things makes me like a good director and a good uh, producer because like you know you, you you know enough to like be able to talk to the crew and, and know what you're asking not asking for like absurd things and and during that time in brazil uh, sorry if i'm just like machine gun talking here but uh and often come back come back <laughs> a bit. but uh you look over and both of us are asleep. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> this is awesome, man. This is, I, I mean, like, this is great. This is great. Uh, no, can, I, can I, uh, Pedro, interrupt you really quickly um, and just rewind just a little bit, and then we can fast forward a little bit to where you are now. Um, I was, I was, I'm really, really curious because I'd never been to Brazil before. Um, like, what was the environment like growing up in Brazil and what was your family like and what were you like as a kid were you like you know kind of take us back to that young five-year-old Pedro yeah well well I grew up in Rio and I was really lucky you know to grow up in a family that was well off my dad like most of the time had a job my mom was a was an engineer and like later later like college professor so uh and we always grew up 
kind of, you know, near the beach and very sunny, very, very hot Rio de Janeiro. And uh, especially at the time, I think like in the, sorry if it's, this is going to get a bit like a uh, therapy session here. But, Do it. Uh, Do it. At the time, lay back. Like, if you want to lay back, I can take notes. In the early, <laughs> in the early 90s, I, I think something that people here uh, in, in North America can understand is like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, so in the early 90s, there was like the Jiu Jitsu boom in Brazil, of like the Gracies and stuff like that. And in Rio de Janeiro, that was very strong. Like, like a lot of kids were like really into fighting in Jiu Jitsu. And I was into playing uh, tabletop RPGs and, and, <laughs> and Super Nintendos. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so right, you know, I'm I, 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 just laughing at, at I've, I've always felt like I, I didn't like to go to the beach. I was, I was very ashamed of my body and uh, was very like kind of pasty white for a Brazilian. Uh, and so, you know, it was. So you're not covered in like MMA tattoos or something. That's <laughs> no, no. I, I had them. I had them lasered out. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, a little bit of like a fish out of water, uh, being kind of a, a, a kind of a chubby nerd in a city that's very like in very aggro. Like you gotta, yeah, you gotta have a tan body and the muscles and ugh, like summer's coming. Where's your summer bod kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, I feel a little bit of fish out of water, but I had a really happy childhood. Like I, I can't complain. I had, I had a very loyal, small group of friends who, you know, we all thought alike and, and we liked to play. We were so nerdy. We didn't play D and D. We played GURPS, which was, which is a more complicated version of a tabletop game because it has more rules. And you can play on different settings. It can, it's not just fantasy. You can play like I like to play cyberpunk stuff and like sci-fi stuff. Oh. So uh, groups, yeah, I highly recommend people well, rediscover uh, groups. <laughs> uh, I think it's called it's a, it's it stands for generic universal art like role playing system. Playing system. Oh, okay. What what was your um was your family supportive of you um, wanting to become an artist? Yes, yes. I had really supportive parents. Uh, it was actually when, when I, I, I was kind of like feeling kind of lost with advertising and like I was not happy with my life. Like I was just like very, like didn't know what to do. I was feeling too old at the time. I was like drinking a lot, which is something that Brazilians do too. Uh, and, and it was totally like my parents and my, my, my mom especially who were like was like you should do something if you if you want to pursue the pursue this animation thing go for it you're young you know make mistakes and and yeah and, my, and like my love of drawing uh totally comes from my dad who you know loved to draw and like my happiest childhood memories was was is just like me and my dad just laying flat on the floor just with a bunch of pieces of paper scattered on the room and just drawing stuff. So your dad could draw. Yeah, yeah. He he went to architecture school, so you know it's kind of kind of pick it up. And he loved to draw. He loved to. Uh, we still have some of his like oil paintings in, in my mom's apartment. My dad's passed for like two years now, but uh, he definitely left a, a huge huge legacy inside of me yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what did he, what did he think about you pivoting from, um, advertising to, at that point, was it animation or is it just kind of something else for you? Just kind of like, Yeah, it was something else. Like, I don't know where animation came from because I was writing for, I was writing at the, at the ad agency, mm -hmm. but at the same time I was making a web comic with a friend and, and so the web comic was kind of my only source of creative pleasure it during like a whole year yeah so i was like maybe i should go to this towards this thing but this is making me happy everything else is making me miserable uh so animation just came as someone who like loved watching cartoons and i, I i've always liked to draw i've always felt like like i could i didn't draw well enough to make to turn into a career so it was a leap of faith in a way of like, oh man, I don't know if I can do it well enough. And I mean, surely enough, the time you, you start to draw every single day, 
because you're in school, because you're working, you start to get better because it's, you know, it's just like hitting skill. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I've, you know, and, and imposter syndrome, it's something that is going to follow me my entire life. Uh, I, 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 had, I, had this, I had this really cool talk with one of the mentees at Rise Up where uh, they were talking about imposter syndrome and it's like, do you feel it? It's like, yeah, I feel it every single day. It's not going to go away. I have to live with this person. Yes, Pedro. Yes, I said something. I said that exact thing to somebody just yesterday or two days ago or three days ago. Of like, they were talking about imposter syndrome, and like, it's very real. It's never going to go away. I yeah. it, like as long as you, it, it really doesn't go away, right? So we either accept it or accept it. Those are the only two options. That's one option. But yeah, like, embrace, it. <laughs> embrace, embrace it, embrace it. Yeah, sorry, yeah. that's the yeah. other option. Yeah, except it. Of course, it's going to be a friend and like. Hello. Hey, we're we're in this together. Let's go. Hello, imposter syndrome. Yeah, because yeah, don't don't. I've been here in a long time. Yeah, I, I think trying to fight it just makes it worse. <laughs> I always feel that. Not that today. I'll probably feel that tomorrow. Um, but anyway, uh, I got yeah, imposter syndrome. Which kind of leads me to, um, we kind of went through a little bit of like how you broke into the industry even down from Canada into yeah. Brazil. But I was really curious, man, um, and I went through this too, of like what were some of the biggest challenges you had sort of breaking into the industry and then sort of how did you um, overcome them? Uh, I had a very weird career of like working in three places my entire career so i was working for birdo for for 10 11 years and that's when i did osvaldo and cupcake and dino and then i spent a year and change freelancing for for ollie's pack as a as an ep and now disney disney is my third job in the industry so uh i mean the challenges for me were just not you know I, I i never had to like i've never actually had to put together like a demo reel other than my very first one uh that i used to get a job at birdo uh and it was a pretty quick process of like i submitted to the place when they had an interview the next like two days later they're like oh you want to come here i was like yeah sure i want to come in brazil the struggle is animation pays really really bad mm. uh so it is, it is a, still a growing industry and there's still an industry where there's a lot of people who's like, yeah, you love doing this, right? So I don't have to pay you a lot of money because you know, it's a dream. Uh, and, and you know, the, the, the budgets for the shows are super tiny compared to like budgets, what budgets would be here. So, you know, a lot of the struggle is, is dealing with the idea that you're gonna get paid very very low a very very low wage for a long time so uh i'm sure that there, especially during these first years of that i was in the industry if i if i wanted to have kids for example or something like that i would probably have to quit the industry at that point or find like a second job or something like that wow. uh which which didn't happen so uh so dealing with that uh you know dealing with uh I guess artistically, it's it's just a lot of dealing with like insecurities and 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 because working on a an, on a on a studio where you're doing a different project every month, it means you're doing like a different style every month as well. So sometimes it'd be like, oh man, I can't do this. Like I have like this really like realistic character that I have to animate, and I I don't draw realistic. I draw like super cartoony. But you know, just putting your head down and and training and and taking it a bit by bit and, and pose by pose and eventually you get there uh having someone to count on as to give you directions and to help you out and, and and also not being scared of reaching out to those people and being like i need help this is not working did, when you were starting out did uh, pedro when you were starting out did you have a mentor there in brazil oh he just vomited into a trash can <laughs> <laughs> So I had, you know, I had the, 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 the studio partners and, and the people who worked around me. Everyone was really supportive. It was a very supportive environment. So, uh, you know, I, I knew that I could, like, just be like, okay, I can't. I'm struggling. Like, help me. Like, 
like I was thinking. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of people, especially because of the nature of artists, that you know, a lot of people are very introspective and are very shy and, and communicating sometimes is an issue. Uh, and, and to be able to, to break that and not, not be scared to not know things. Like it's, it's everyone doesn't know things <laughs> sometimes. So don't be, don't be ashamed and, and look for help and, and get the help because that's how you learn, that's how you grow. Uh, yeah, people, people will understand it. If, if you're working with someone who punishes you for asking, then the problem is, is with that person and that person is a bag of dicks. So um, <laughs> it's not your problem. Not one, a bag. Uh, <laughs> um, and at that time, at that time, Pedro, you were, um, you were in Brazil and um, you said that the industry wasn't, wasn't big, but I'm assuming because it wasn't um, as big, the, uh, uh, the people that were there um, and your creatives around you banded together. Was, was that the case in Rio? That the what was bad, sorry? Oh yeah, so um, because you guys were such a small sort of industry of like animation professionals that love to draw and love, you know, animation, was there kind of a network of people that you can um, reach out to for that kind of mentorship? Uh, definitely, like like the, the industry there is pretty small. So once you got started and once you went to like, you know, and, and when I started in animation Brazil and I've always worked in Sao Paulo and, but they would do like these, sometimes they would do like these kind of bi-weekly or monthly like meetups back when people went to places and met in person uh, so kind of like, you know, stuff like, like drink and draw and stuff like that. Uh, so, so it was really easy to like get to know everybody if you wanted, because it was just like a half, half a dozen, like a like couple of dozen people. Uh, eventually the industry became bigger, uh, because in the kind of like around 20, 2009 or 2010, the government passed a, a, a quota law, like the one that they have in, uh, in Canada, in which uh, every single network had to show 30 minutes of Brazilian content every day. Uh, oh, wow! So in Canada, they also have the same the same uh, law, and and it's it's a law that serves to you know as a stimulus to the industry to force the industry to grow. So some some networks are okay, like the networks that show like you know hours of soap opera every day. They're like, oh, fine, we have Brazilian content to spare. But places like Disney and Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. Uh, they had nothing. They had like it's like oh we, we're we're an animation network and there's no Brazilian animation. What what do you want us to do? So they had to scramble to uh, find shows and buy shows and and find pitches, uh, and that's how I got my start because I've always dreamed of of making content. And my first exposure to making content was I, I did a student film at VFS uh, that was really shitty. But it was enough for someone in Nickelodeon in the UK, uh, an executive there, messaged me, sent me an email saying, I saw your short, do you have any ideas for shows? And I was like, and I lied to her, I was like, oh yes, yes, I have many ideas for shows. <laughs> uh, so so, so I, I partnered up with a friend, we, we sent her two pitches and they were, they were horrible, they were like <laughs> terrible pitches. And of course she said no, as she would, but that kind of like, lit up a spark of like, oh, I want to do this. This is really fun. Sure. Uh, but I'm in Brazil. What do I do? Luckily, they passed that law. Uh, I started making a pitch for Osvaldo, which was kind of like, like I said, based on my childhood, because it's a penguin who lives in Rio. So he feels like a fish out of water. He doesn't like to, you know, uh, uh, he's not a very athletic guy or anything like that. So he's a big nerd. So uh, we pitched it to Cartoon Network, Cartoon Network, uh, really liked it. Uh, we got some government uh, grant money and we did the first season, which was just 13, 11 minute episodes, which was what we could afford. Uh, and that was like my first experience as like a show creator and, and wait, wait, uh, the whole wait, process okay. of the How stuff. did you, okay, so A, who, you partnered uh, with someone from Rio or, uh, so, sorry, uh, Sao Paulo? Yeah, I took, I took the pitch to the studio that I worked on, okay. Birdo. Got it. And, 
and they're like, okay, I like, we like this pitch. We, they're also like, we, we never made shows before. It's new to us. Okay. So, but let's take a flyer on this and see what happens. And you know, it's, yeah. it's a gamble. And we ended up getting the show funded. It took years to get the show funded, but we eventually got the show funded. Yeah, and, that's awesome. And, so, and, so, and, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I'm also trying to learn things. How did you get the funding for the uh, um, from the from from Sao Paulo? So the government had a yeah. They have they have like a loan program where they'll loan loan you money with like very like no interest uh and you can pay back after you sell the show or you know sell it to networks and stuff like that so hey guys so you send a project in they analyze it they get like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of projects and, sure, and sure. they get some to to get a grant so we got that grant which was very low money for per episode like compared to the budgets here it's like insane it's, yeah. the whole season costs like like a minute of animation here <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh Oh my but it was super fun because we we not none of the people involved had had ever done a show before, and we were just guessing. We were just like, I guess this is how you make a, an animatic, and this is how you like I don't know. And so we just kind of went in the dark, and and it created like of course I would have done some things completely different, but some things that were kind of weird were a result of that of just like not knowing. And I kind of love the process of like discovering by yourself. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, the opening for the show has zero animation. It's just live action footage of penguins, uh, like walking around on a beach. Uh, so, so, you know, that, that's kind of stuff where like any network these days would be like, no, what are you doing? Like, it's a kid's show. And so, but uh -huh. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> Uh, from that first pitch, uh, development and first pitch, like what, what do you think? I'm like, what would you, now that you've gone through it, I mean, it was successful, obviously, but like, what did you learn from it? You think that helped your pitches um, moving forward? Uh, I think it, 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 it helped me, like, first of all, find out that uh, a show kind of takes, takes a couple of years to take form, even conceptually. Uh, because the, the very first pitch for the show was very different than the show that came out on TV. Mm. And it wasn't, it wasn't for net, it wasn't because of network pressure because we had zero network pressure. The show was completely independent. It was just us like having the time because, because the, 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 the money for the show took us like a couple of years. We had the time to digest the pitch and make changes and make sure the show matured. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, Development is really like, it's a game of patience a lot of the times and a game of letting ideas brew and, and, and get better and mature. So uh, I'm really happy that we had that time. And sometimes I'll tell people like, if you want to make a show, you have to like, you have to be prepared because it's going to take like, you know, five years from the moment you create, like you have the idea to you when you see it on TV, sometimes even longer. I've seen cases of like 10, 15 years and, and people are, like people who don't know about animation are like super shocked. Like, what do you mean five years? It's like, yeah, it, it, and it's, you know, it sounds like it sucks, but sometimes it's for the best because you get to mature those ideas. You get to, it's like you're refining it to the, the purest form of, of the basic elements that really work. Uh, so in the case of Osvaldo, it's a very, it's a very clean example of like, it's a show about Penguin in Rio, who's, uh, you know, fish out of water. The first version of the show, it was all penguin jokes. It was just like, like he's he's feeling way too hot. He's sweaty. He he eats like smelly anchovies in school and stuff like that. Uh, and then at some point, we decided uh, that penguin jokes. Not only penguin jokes were not allowed, but no one in the show is allowed to call him a penguin. Uh, Why? Because. Uh, like how many penguin jokes, like if you want to make a show that has like hundred episodes, how many penguin jokes can you make? Like you probably like by episode three, you're struggling with like, okay, we've done all the penguin jokes in the world. And, and, and the idea of the show is not to single him out as a penguin, but single him out as kind of an off, offbeat, weird kid. So the fact that we didn't call attention to the fact that he's a penguin and he's just a weird kid who looks like a penguin, 
just made the show so much uh, more complex and, and fun to write because then you're just writing stories about your own childhood and, and how you felt like an outcast and how you felt weird. And we don't need to go into the whole penguin thing. Like it's not, it, it's not relevant. It ended up not being relevant for the character except for as a visual metaphor. Mm. So you're distilling the show into the basic concept of this kid who feels like he doesn't belong but he's happy because he's got like this niche group of friends that, you know, they stick together. <clears throat> One of the things I think that, um, these are some of the questions that I get, uh, that a lot of times people think that they have to come to California to make it, you know, they, they have to get in and they get it. They got to get hired at Pixar, you know, in order to make it. And, um, and I always try to tell them, you know, that, that you want to start out at some of these smaller studios, because if you're working at a smaller studio, you're going to get a chance to do more things. And when I started out at Deke Entertainment, we, we were doing everything, you know, because we were a small studio, because we were, we were flying by the seat of our pants. You know, you, you had to do character designs, backgrounds, you had to paint the, uh, the, the backgrounds. I was doing freelance um, uh, backgrounds, so I was painting um, uh, at, at night. And, uh, and because of that, you grow really quickly and you also get opportunities that you wouldn't normally get. And I think that what you're saying is really a testament to that, to, to uh, just having these opportunities present themselves for you. So the people that are listening right now and think like, oh, gosh, if I could only get to here, like I, that's when I can make it. And I think it's so important to to take a look, see where you're at and look for opportunities where you're at. And, and just in, in the same way that you did that. You know, it turned into a stepping stone. One thing turned into another. You landed at one place and, you know, you were there for several years. You went from five people, five employees to 70 employees and it, and it grew into, and into something big and you got an opportunity that probably if you ran the, if, if you went through the route that everybody else does, you know, staying in Vancouver uh, and then, and then going that route of, you know, going through animation uh, and, and then going through that process, it would take you that much longer. So I, I, I think kudos to you, and I think it should be inspirational to all those people listening right now that uh, they're, they're actually surrounded by opportunities that they're not noticing because sometimes they're, they're so focused. They've got this tunnel vision. If I could just get to Pixar, if I could just get to CalArts, if I could just get to Vancouver. But really, if you look around, there's opportunities all around, and it's important to, to see that, spot them, and take advantage of that. Yeah, it, I, I think it's very, you know, like like – we, we're all, we're all, you know, a decade or so into our careers and looking in, in hindsight, it's like, you see like, like, yeah, that, that was my journey and it worked. And I think a lot of people who are starting are like, yeah, it's, it's call arts, it's Pixar. And that's, you know, that's the path yeah. to success. Yeah. And that's the only thing that matters where, yeah, just, I, I always tell uh, younger people like, do, do one thing a day that would benefit your career. Like, like go study a little thing or do a drawing or, you know, start a, start a personal project or send out a portfolio and, and take it one day at a time. And, and yeah, I think, I think what you said, Marcelo, is just like be aware of opportunities that are within reach instead of looking for the ones that aren't and just longing for them and feeling bitter and feeling like, you know, just, just, yeah, keep on pushing and, and, there are so many opportunities out there with the internet and with, you know, this kind of global community that is forming in animation where like the, the, the path of like, you know, saying like call arts and Pixar, it's like, it's like, it's like your dad saying like, Oh no, you got to work in the factory and go up from, you know, like have the same yeah. job for 20 years and that's how your successful career. Like there's yeah. so many stuff you can do. You should be, you could be freelancing, you could be selling your shit on like an online store. Like it, it doesn't really matter like you if you're if, if you if you push hard enough and, and you're creative and you're dedicated and you're, and you're you're a person who's nice to work with and you, you know how to collaborate you can get to a good place and it might, it might not be the place you're imagining but it's still a good place agreed and then um i mean that's a i mean i think that's a great like way to like um, what I loved about your story, Pedro, is that it's, <clears throat> it's um, we talked about this before of kind of launching yourself from abroad, right? And with Rise Up Animation, you know, we have a lot of applicants around the world 
we talk to every um, uh, aspiring artist and student from every country. And, you know, the majority of um, the, the people we are honored to meet are um, from other parts of the world, like other, like the clear other side of the world, um, yeah. our corners of the world. And, you know, a lot of times um, the question is, um, you know, is this even worth pursuing, you know, for me? you know, where I live and, um, and, and I, I, I grew up in Seattle and Hollywood seems so far away. I can't even <laughs> imagine, I can't even imagine what Cairo or Delhi must feel like. Um, and so that's why I love stories like yours of just kind of like launching yourself from abroad. Um, and so if you can, anything um, to speak to that uh, in lightness of like, you know, um, what what can someone um, like coming from abroad that wants to get into animation, whether it's locally in their own um, cities or in Hollywood, in LA? Um, uh, and I know that's a big loaded question, but um, we can we can talk through it. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know everyone's experience is different, and I'm I'm talking about my personal experience, and and I know that. Some, some people live or grew up in much, much tougher places than, than Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so, so, of course, I, I, you know, like I'm speaking from experience, you, you, and every, so, so I think sometimes I, I might speak in absolutes, but uh, please be aware that you take what works for you and you throw away what doesn't work for you, like, like any advice ever in your life. Uh, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, when I when I when I didn't get a job in Canada after going to VFS and had to go back to Brazil, like my first thought was like I'm screwed. Like I'm I'm probably gonna have to go back to advertising uh, to make a living. So, uh, but I gave it a shot. I got a job. I was lucky that I got a job in the studio. Uh, I'm lucky that Brazil had that that industry, even though it's a very cottage industry. It, it was still there. So I got to work on something I loved and, but there was no content in it. There's no, you know, no series to be heard of. Uh, so, so what I decided to do is like, okay, I'm going to try as hard as I can to carve my own path and, and to, you know, if, if there are no shows, let's try to make a show. So, so then I, so that's when I started like every day after work, I would get home. And I started like that's all I did is like doing show pitches and, and drawing characters for show pitches and and mm -hmm. just imagine like you know I, w I would make like you know five ten pitches and and uh, it it little by little worked out like first I got a show that was local in Brazil and it was uh, uh, you know very self contained and it only played in Brazil to begin with and then after that started expanding to other cartoon networks. Uh, but then I was like, okay, this, I, I, I can do this. What's the next step? The next step would be like, I want to make a show that has like a bigger audience and maybe outside of Brazil. So, you know, I, I was lucky also that Birdo, the studio really supported me and, and, you know, it was, a, a, a what do you call it, like a symbiotic uh, relationship where, you know, if I grow, you grow and we grow together kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in Rio, they have a very regional, uh, what, what, like an event, right? they call it a market, which is, I, I don't know if you guys heard of like Kids Screen and Metcom. Oh yeah, Kids Screen. Places yeah. where uh, people go to pitch the projects and you know, the networks are there, executives and studios are there. And Brazil had a really small event like that called Rio Content Market. Uh, so, so I went with Birdo to the, to the show and we took a couple of my pitches with us and we set up pitching sessions with different studios and we pitched to this to this uh, Canadian British studio called E1 who owns Peppa Pig so they got you know they had some some cash to spend uh, so and they they really and that's that's when I pitched Cupcake and Dino for the first time and they took Cupcake and Dino back to Canada after a couple of months they called us and said like we want to option this and try to make it into a show so we're really excited. We sold it to them as an option, and uh, we made a 
we developed the show and that's how I got to meet Mark, who's my creative partner now at Disney. Uh, Mark was the, the head of story and, and he developed the show with me. And so we developed the show, we developed the pitch Bible, we did a trailer for the show, which is like a two minute trailer. And we just went around and started pitching to networks with, with E1 as like, you know, our kind of stamp of like, you know, like Garrett, like this show's gonna, if you guys pick this up, it'll get made because there's a, you know, there's the, the backing of a big studio behind. Yeah, man. So we pitched it, we pitched it to Disney, to Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, and eventually Netflix picked it up. Nice. And so, that's how we got to make Cupcake and Dino. It was a Brazilian Canadian co-production. Nice. And, and the one, th the one of the things that I was really, you know, when we we're drafting contracts and like talking about like how the show's going to get made, I knew that a lot of the pre-production was going to be done in Brazil, but the animation and a lot of the boards were going to be done in Canada. And so one of the things I was like, okay, I, I like if I'm directing the show, I want to be in Canada when animation takes off because I want to be there because I. I want to learn. I want to be in a in a big like service studio, uh, and I want to you know and I want to uh, just like take it all in and, and grow as a professional by by just being in on the floor with the animators and the crews. Right. So so I got a chance to go to Canada for a year and a half uh, during the whole animation and post production process for the show. Uh, I had to direct all fifty two episodes of the show, which is. Uh, and be an executive producer, which is insane, and I almost died, and I don't recommend it to anyone. But you didn't die. No, I didn't die, but it was it was it was tough. <laughs> it was a lot of work, I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I think that's kudos to you because what you did is that you recognized an opportunity, and uh, and then you jumped on it. You saw that look, it, it's not just my uh, my selling this idea. Oh, great! I sold this idea. I can stay in Brazil. Uh, but you you sold the idea and you thought you know what what's gonna get me to the next level and you were thinking about that and you were making a conscious decision I have to go I have to go to Canada I have to be part of the production I have to learn this process I, I, kudos to you yeah thanks thank you yeah that, that, that's that was the thought of like uh, you know like if you feel like you've hit a, some sort of ceiling you gotta find your next ceiling to hit like you gotta you know, crash through that one and find a way to So, so it was a, an amazing experience. The, the the people at Atomic who did the show were fantastic and super friendly. I've I've never felt like I've anything but welcome there. Uh, and I got to learn a lot. And I, you know, I got to also like like we were talking about asking for help. I was really overwhelmed. I was like, okay, I'm I'm coming from like making a weird little show in Brazil with 13 episodes to making like 52 for Netflix with like a huge crew and I'm, I'm one of the EPs and creator and the director of this whole thing. I'm completely overwhelmed and completely terrified and just be able to be like, hey guys, uh, this part of the process, I've never done before. So uh, can we talk about it? Can you guys teach me? Can you teach me how this, you know, how this pipeline works? And, and please tell me if I'm doing anything wrong. Like I, I will take it, I will process it and I will, try to be better like right. Right. so so having that like being able to kind of bear yourself uh naked a little bit is is good uh yeah. because awesome, man. uh you know that you you get nothing from like pretending that you know something and just being arrogant mm -hmm. about it and you know making people work twice because you didn't understand what you're doing but you pretended mm -hmm. you did uh so you know you're already there you're already like it's the same thing with like crediting your crew. Like you're already the creator of the show. You're already like like people already know that you have the credit for this. Why not credit the crew as well? Because it's their work, and you know, like I didn't do everything. It's not like yeah. so. one of, one of the things I found professionally is exactly what you're saying is that if you're comfortable in allowing people to be part of that process, you're you know you don't have to have all the answers. You're surrounded by all these other professionals. And the projects that I think that work the best are when the leadership uh, takes, it, they, they give people the opportunity to be part of that process. And that's when projects look fantastic. So a lot of times people think like, oh, I have to have all the answers. I have to be able to tell everybody what to do, how to do their job. No, it, sometimes all you do is in, in providing leadership is you allow people to do their job. And that makes the for the best product. Yeah. And, and, and being like, 
like giving telling people because you're kind of you're kind of like making giving the show its overall tone and making sure everything is consistent and you're acting more as a filter than anything else but allowing people to put their heart into the show and to put themselves in the show uh like our show was script driven it was not board driven but uh we were lucky to have amazing board artists who you know we would tell them like if you have a gag that you want to put into the board if you don't want to follow the script like go for it like make it funny put put your stamp on it and the best feeling in the world is to be surprised by something you you would have never thought in a million years uh you know because I, I, you want to be like you want to be surrounded with board artists who are better at boarding than you. You want to be surrounded with animators who are better animators than you. You just want to have people who are way better than you all around you. Uh, you do not like should be scared of like you know like oh this person is going to do a better job than I could ever could. Like, great, that's awesome. That's the whole point. Yeah, yeah, not to be afraid. Yeah, I mean that's awesome, guys. I mean building out that, I was kind of thinking of like. Um, our, our audience as well love just kind of like um, aspiring artists trying to um, break into the industry. Um, like Pedro and Marcelo, uh, we can throw this out to you too, of like, what do you guys look for in entry level, kind of beginner, kind of, I'm trying to break into the industry, story artists, um, vis of artists, those kinds of things. We can start for, uh, with Pedro. What do you think? Uh, I, I haven't had a chance to like, like, yeah, I've, I've had a chance to hire people in, in shows and stuff, but I think that you want someone, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking from kind of a warped perspective of Brazil yeah, where like, totally. yep. like a lot of, because the industry is so young, I, I feel like a lot of the artists try to be generalists and try to like mm -hmm. give you a portfolio with like everything. Mm -hmm. And and I think if you're hiring for specifically for a TV production, you're hiring for a specific job. Like we, you know, we right. talked about that single track thing. So, like, focus on your focus on what you know you think you can do best, and and like be kind of you know single track minded about like okay, I'm gonna make like a kick-ass storyboard portfolio or a kick-ass character design portfolio instead of just being like piecemeal, like a little bit of everything. If if you can do more than one thing, well make sure that it's it's well like separated on your website on your portfolio uh also like very important make sure that when people click on your link for your portfolio that your work is instantly accessible in the first 10 seconds like because the recruiter whoever is hiring or the director or producer they get hundreds and hundreds of links and so they're going to click and they're going to look at it for 10 seconds if they can't find anything if you made like some sort of Byzantine process to get to your work and you have to click on five different things, they're not gonna get to it. They're just gonna be like, ah, whatever. So make, make stuff easy to find, easy to read, easy to understand, well like separated into categories. So, you know, if they're looking for a board artist, they know where the boards are. Uh, don't, don't make people like watch stuff that you don't, you, like they'll resent you for having to watch things that they don't have to watch. This is kind of a loaded uh, question, uh, Pedro, but like, what do, you, what do you love to see like in a story artist portfolio? I mean, I know there's probably a ton, but like if you can um, whittle it down to maybe like one or three or like, like for instance, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, well, I have, I have very specific tastes. So I like, I don't respond as much to like, like an awesomely boarded, like crazy action scene as much as I respond to like a funny scene. So I'm looking for a lot of personality, a lot of like different, like if I see like an expression I have never seen before, that's like, whoa, like this person is bringing some, some cool shit to the table. Right, right. So I love right. like, like, just like, because comedy can be uh, sometimes very, uh, especially live action comedy can be very stale of like just making like you know like like shot reverse shot kind of like dialogue and adding visual comedy to the dialogue comedy for me it, it's it's such a gift that good storyboarders bring so uh, I always refer like every time we had I had a storyboard kickoff on any of my shows 
I would send them the link of, uh, you know that, that YouTube uh, Every Frame of Painting? Oh, yeah. So that guy's from Vancouver, actually. And, but he has a video on Edgar Wright and visual comedy. Yep. And I always share with the crew, I always share that video because I think it's so great. It's such a great distillation of like, like ad, ad jokes, they're a visual because this is a visual medium. So, so it, and it's a problem, I think, not, not so much with kids animation, but a lot of like adult animation just seems to be the shot reverse shot. And like you're missing so many opportunities of like thinking going, things going in and out of frame in a funny way or uh, reaction shots that are funny. So finding opportunities to be funny that are not just, you know, people talking to each other or finding funny expressions or just weird ways to tell things. Like animation is such, such a limitless toolbox that having people use that in favor of comedy for me is like something that really jumps at me. Uh, I've never been like an action show, so <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't board an action scene to save my life, so. What about you, Marcelo? What do you look for? Uh, <laughs> First and foremost, in a, in a broad sense of in this that portfolios. Yeah, you know, uh, oh, I, I've got a, uh, I'm going to bail after this question. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll, right. I'll leave yeah. it to you, you guys can, to you finish out. But, but uh, what I, what I look for, it's funny because when I, when I think of one of the things I think that drives us is our desire. It's your desire to succeed, uh, and I, and I used to believe that that if you know you just if you have this desire that desire will motivate you and, and you're going to hang in there and you're going to do what it is that that you need to do to get to your goal um but a lot of people have desire and a lot of people want to work in the industry and what you need more than just desire you also got to put in the hard work and and it was uh, made evident there was this guy uh his, his name was ron coleman and he is like, he's been like one of the, the most famous bodybuilders since uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm watching his, his uh, I, I guess there was a documentary about him. And this guy is just insanely huge with all these muscles. And he's sitting there and he's got these like, he's curling like a hundred pounds or something. He's just some insane amount of weight. And, and he just had this really simple philosophy. And he said, everybody wants big muscles but it ain't nobody want to do the hard work. And I thought, you know, that that's really true because, you know, we, we all have this desire and this desire for all these goals that we have, whether it's to get an animation, whether it's to be, you know, a great uh, MMA jujitsu guy, whether it's to be you know, a top bodybuilder. You know, sometimes we have all these desires and passion, but we're not willing to put in the hard work. So I, I would say those, that's one of the things I'm looking for. When I look at a portfolio, I don't just want to see, you know, the, you know, someone who, who carefully took time to craft something. No, uh, I want to see somebody that has done so much work and that has gotten so prolific at something that you can see that, uh, you can see it in their work. You can see that their comfortableness in being able to draw something because it told me that it's not that they just had the desire. They had the desire and they were willing to do the hard work. And I think that's one of the things that is uh, really important. So just know that if you have all of this desire uh, and it, that the guy next to you also has a lot of desire. So it's more important, it, it's just as important to have that desire, but then also uh, have the focus. And like Pedro was saying, look, find the path, you know, and, and set goals for yourself. Uh, so that first goal is like, I, I need to get here. And then once you get to that goal, what's your next goal? Set that other goal up. And sometimes you, you can even set, set up multiple goals as you're working through and you already have them. Okay, I'm, I'm at step one. I, I, I'll be at step two by the end of the year. Uh, and so I think that, you know, having, uh, being willing to do the hard work is uh, what makes the difference in, in, in you know, building somebody's talent. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome, Marcel. All right. Well, yeah. I'm I'm going to bail out. It, it, it was yeah. a really wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Bobby, thank for inviting me. Thank you for uh, being a good moderator last minute. Yeah. And Pedro, it is wonderful hearing your story. And uh, I, you are such an inspiration. You really are. Uh, your, your work. I, I, it's an absolute joy to look at your work. Oh man. And, uh, and, and, <laughs> and you are you are the embodiment of your work. It, it's it's a joy to to know you. Dude, thank you so much, man. I, 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 you, you've, you've made me feel very welcome from, from the very first day. And I, I 
really appreciate it. And I, and I love that you guys just jumped in here and <laughs> I had a talk with us. Amazing. No, it, Thank it, you so it, much. It, I, it, I, miss, I miss seeing all of you guys. In, bring it in, guys. Bring it in. Bring it in, bring it in right there. Ah, oh, oh, there we go. Oh, there. God. <laughs> and I'll, I'll talk to you on Monday. <laughs> Woo! All right. Take care, guys. Bye, Marcelo. Um, but if anyone has any last minute, um, uh, Pedro, I mean, like, uh, honestly, this was amazing, and uh, this is a lot of fun. Um, I learned a ton, um, and hopefully um, everyone else did as well. Um, if you want to give a shout-out to all the Brazilian, there's a ton of Brazilian. Yeah. E aí, galera do Brasil? Uh, it's, it, I don't know. It's kind of dopey. It's just that, but... I, oh no, just I, if, whatever I, you want to say. I'm really, I'm just so really happy that to see so many Brazilians here and, and, and to see that how much the Brazilian industry is growing and how Brazilian professionals are uh, like really valued, I feel like in Brazil and outside of Brazil. Uh, there's, I've, I have so many people I know on Twitter and Instagram from Brazil who are doing work for, you know, places in LA and all over the world in the UK. I have friends that are, you know, animating stuff for Valve. I have a friend who works at Leica, who's an amazing stop motion animator. Uh, there's two Brazilians over at Cartoon Network making shows. Uh, it's animator, Brazilian animators working on Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, it's, it's crazy and like Brazilians are, are constantly like, I feel like employers uh, constantly saying the Brazilian uh, artists are very like flexible and and never miss a deadline and are very professional and creative and and that makes my heart sing because uh, I think I think that since we come from you know an industry that that's much smaller and and you know not as 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 full of resources as the industry here I think we really value the chances that we get outside the industry and and we really value. Uh, putting our best foot forward uh, so it's 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 really cool to see Brazil representing and hopefully uh, I, I'll be able to use my position currently to bring more like not just Brazilian artists but like Brazilian related content and and Brazilian things into into the content that I make yeah. uh, for sure that's a plan <laughs> Love it. Uh, so, what, what, what uh, Pedro? What would you like to see in? Um, that's a loaded question. I'll ask it. What would you like to see in, like, the Brazilian um, Sao Paulo, Rio um, animation industry in the future, moving forward? Uh, I would like to see the. I'd like to see the industry there be a bit more uh, self sustainable uh, in a way that you know just see studios paying better and making sure that people can make like a not not just like survive by working in animation but actually make a good living working in animation yeah. uh, without being necessarily a studio owner but being someone who just you know works as an animator or something like that yeah uh, you know so so people can to see so people can fulfill their dreams and their creative urges uh, in Brazil, and not necessarily by just dreaming of leaving Brazil and leaving the country to work somewhere else. Absolutely, I think that's yeah. that's a huge, that's yeah. a huge dream. Uh, and, and, and to have a government that supports artists and supports arts, which currently Brazilian government does not support arts, and they think that art is superfluous and think that art is for uh, you know people who don't like to work. So so that government can uh, you know go F themselves. Uh, because you mean there's no, there's no funding for it? Uh, well, they're cutting, they're, they're just stripping everything down. They're cutting funding and they're cutting, they're cutting uh, any sort of like anything related to culture and music and, and, and the cinema, all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. just being like stripped of everything because we have a president who's a, who's an idiot who does not believe in art, does not appreciate art. And mm -hmm. he just he he just wants to be a dictator. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's a very familiar story to uh, the yeah. United States. So yeah, that guy can go fuck himself. Yeah, he's on the call actually. He has a question. 
Oh, cool. Oh, my God. Uh, cool. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind telling no, you no, everything I, I just said. Support the arts. What are you talking about? Um, but uh, no, um, Pedro, in all uh, seriousness, I, um, I mean, that's exactly, we're going through that a little bit in the Philippines as well. But uh, I can understand in yeah. the that that can, I mean, stifle like the whole artistic community. Like, you know, it's like, what, well, what the hell are we doing here? Or the industry in there as well. So, um, yeah, ho hopefully we'll get through that. Our Art artists are, are nothing but resilient. We've, we've survived our family telling us we shouldn't work with that. We've, uh, you know, survived the terrible salaries. We'll, we'll survive governments too. So we'll, we'll always be around no matter what governments do to get rid of us. And we'll always be critiquing uh, power and, and telling the truth. And because, you know, it, I, know, I know TV is like this weird intersection between commerce and art uh, where, you know, we have to uh, respond to, you know, money and power and, and, and we have to abide by the rules of, you know, the networks and the studios and all that. And that's fine. It's part of the, the, the deal. It's part of the game. But uh, try to infuse our art with truth and with passion and compassion. And not, not just like, I think, I truly believe that all art is political. Uh, and it, it doesn't need to be about politics. It can just be about, like, empathy and compassion and being a nice person in the world and right. especially working on kids tv which is what we do it, yep. it's very important to infuse our art with a lot of empathy uh yep. roger ebert like i think probably his most famous quote is that move like films are empathy machines and i totally believe that like the, the reason why people watch you know a movie or a tv show is to connect with people and connect with feelings and, and feel as lonely because we're seeing our own feelings and emotions replicated on the screen. Mm -hmm. And it makes us think like, oh, I'm not the only person who feels this. I'm not the only person who's struggling. And that why, that's why Rise Up, and that's why you know, diversity and representation in animation or any form of art is important because people want to connect, people want to feel empathy. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's also a political stance because I feel like the world now is really devoid of empathy in some, some of its darkest corners. And I think a lot of problems are because people are, are uh, not willing to put themselves in other people's shoes. So, you know, making art that really connects with people and, and serve as these empathy machines, it's, it's really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, clearly uh, th this is something that uh, is super important to you, uh, Pedro. And, um, and I, I just kind of want to get your last thoughts on um, representing um, Brazilian culture to the world and Brazilian stories into the world, whether it's live action, animation, um, and uh, just sort of amplifying those kind of voices. What, what do you think about um, where, where the culture is headed? Yeah, well, Brazil is a gigantic country. <laughs> yeah with a gigantic population. We are a big part of the world. We're, uh, so it's, it's, I think, I, and we have such a rich culture. We have such a, a rich history and, and, and a diverse uh, uh, population that I think that, you know, bringing more Brazilian content into the world, it, it's, it, Brazil, Brazilian content manages usually to be really relatable and universal with, at the same time of being very specific and that's that's always a great thing uh i you know i of course like i've, I've infused a lot more brazilian stuff in oswaldo than maybe cupcake and dino or ollie's pack but i i really want to you know sneak sneak in and not not just sneak in but make front and center like you know brazilian culture and brazilian lives and the U.S. has like I think like over a million Brazilian immigrants, uh, and and for me it's about you know that that whole thing of like the more specific you are, the more universal you are, and I think with with diversity and representation it's the same thing. Like the one thing that kind of uh, kind of irks me sometimes is seeing a character in in a show or or 
for, for a movie that's like it's Latino and and because you know Latin America is so big and diverse and there's so right. many different cultures yep. and they're, they're they're interesting and rich and and awesome and like I want to see more specificity don't don't give me a Latino give me a Colombian give me a Mexican give me something from 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 Guinea yep. or yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, give me someone from from uh, Panama or Brazil. Like Brazil, Brazil is a big country that like does not speak Spanish, for example, uh, and we speak Portuguese for people who don't know. So, 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 seeing that specificity and not treating like Latin America as just one big thing that's below America. It's, it's really important to me and seeing that specificity represented and for me especially seeing Brazil represented as a different culture and it's and you know it's it's awesome that we're different like it's not it's not a bad thing yeah. so yeah that for me is uh, important right 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 right, right. Uh, yeah that's amazing man um, yeah and then as we open it up there's all of the country I mean it's like Costa Rica. Colombia, uh, Chile, Peru, uh, uh, Colombia. Someone from the French Guiana. I love the French Guiana. Man, um, but uh, <laughs> Venezuela, India, but, yeah, for sure. Mexico, for sure. I, I, I think the standards for like, you know, like white Western culture are kind of different. Where like, you know, you, you never treat Europe as like one thing. It's like, oh, it's <laughs> Europe, like. True. Oh, Oh, Portugal and Iceland are basically the same thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's such different right, cultures right. and countries inside of Europe, and yeah. why do we treat Latin America as like the as a monoculture? Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's the education, right? Um, but um, I, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Uh, that's a great point that you brought up, and. I, I, I think, uh, like to close it out, I mean, like I'd, um, cause we're at closing at an hour and a half, but, um, I, you know, uh, one thing that I always try to ask is like, what would you try to, you know, through filmmaking, whether it's like, um, show making TV films, uh, movies, what would you like to show the world about, um, Brazilian culture? Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Yeah, it's a hard. I think at this point, like showing any Brazilian culture is is a win. <laughs> Ain't, any, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, hopefully, making, uh, just making making stuff that's like, you know, if you're making a sci-fi movie, for example, or a sci-fi show, like, yeah, does it need to be like an, a U.S. family? To be relatable, like, can you make it? Can you make a sci-fi story, but just swap it for like a family from Venezuela? Like, this is gonna be as relatable as the other one. But you know, you you build you you build the story around that, uh, uh, you know, that that culture and that country, and you you find super rich stuff. Like, right. we, we've we've already seen seen a million movies where. The superhero is, you know, brawny American dude. Like, let's let let's find different superhero stories to to tell and yeah. and, and feed feed off different cultures and yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, I mean, and so your your path from Brazil to LA is a, a specific story too. I mean, like, um, I mean, I'd love. For that story to be told you know at some point like in your career um i just kind of like launching yourself abroad into the states into la yeah. i mean it's completely different as well uh, um, i wish i could talk about the, the show me and mark are developing right? oh no no he <laughs> will get sued we'll get fired tomorrow <laughs> just kidding disney we know you're not gonna fire us no valuable um <laughs> But I guess that the cat's out of the bag because uh, we, 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 I don't think we've been announced yet, but. Yeah, no, no, no. We, yeah, we'll respect that. We'll respect that. Um, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, um, they'll find out uh, sooner or later. But the, I, I guess 
I guess the biggest part is um, in closing of just kind of like, hey, you know, um, you launched yourself abroad, you were in Rio, you made it here in LA, you're thriving, you're on a, you're on a fucking uh, panel, panel that means nothing to anybody, uh, but Rise Up Animation. And, uh, oh, this, this, is, this, this is one of my crowning achievements. I'm on a panel with fucking Bobby Pontillas. That's crazy. I, I, I pinch myself here. Uh, and so we're 200 strong. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I think we have maybe eight minutes. OK. I can't uh, believe it. There's still 200 people here after an hour and 20 minutes. I know. You guys are awesome. Oh, my God. Uh, Bertrand says, in the beginning of your career in Canada, when were you, uh, wait, that's not the one I read. Oh, Pedro, very cool to see a fellow Brazilian be successful. What animated show were you talking about being the only one in, available Brazil. in Brazil? Truma de Monica? Yeah, it's the Monica's Turma? Gang. Uh, it's, it's, Monica's Gang is a very, very popular like kids comic book that's been it's like since I was like a little kid. Uh, Got it. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess two shows. Yeah, they had they had Turma da Monica, but I was talking about uh, Fishonauta, which is I guess called Fishtronaut in English, which is a preschool show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that was an easy one to answer. Like. It. Um, so here's another one. Uh, lightning round. Lightning round. Uh, Bertrand says, in the beginning of your career in Canada. When you were probably less fluent, do you think your accent and English level were a barrier for the studio to take you seriously as a showrunner? Ooh, that's hitting hard. Yeah, I, I've, I mean, I've been lucky to be able to like have studied like English since I was a kid. So uh, I've always had like an ease with English specifically. I don't know how to speak any other languages, but uh, English is pretty good, and I, I I went to VFS and you know stayed in Canada for a year speaking English. Getting you know uh, classes were in English, so I feel like it's never been a barrier. But it is something it is something that I'm very self aware, and I I sometimes I feel kind of bad to be called out on my accent. But mm -hmm. I gotta say that for other people it doesn't freaking matter. Like like I am way more worried about this than anyone else around me. Uh, you know, like, don't worry about your accent. Uh, I, I was scared. I was super scared that my accent would make me sound dumb because I didn't know how to speak English. Uh, but don't worry about it. Like, if someone is giving you crap about your accent, that person is probably not a nice person. <laughs> uh, you know, like, like, you know, if you're Brazilian and you have an accent and, and someone's like, oh, you have an accent. I was like, yeah, let me hear your Portuguese, dude. Don't yeah, don't don't worry about it. Just it, it what what you're saying is more important than how you're saying it. So um uh so um I'll skip around a little bit, sorry guys. Um so uh seeing South uh anonymous attendee, um very personal, uh uh he or she says uh seeing South Americans thrive in this industry really gives me hope that I can do the same. I was wondering if you ever had any weird encounters for being Brazilian, um, weird hmm. encounters. I mean, people. other than people like find, because Brazilians are very huggy and very warm people. Uh, so other than like being, being found out as a Brazilian getting uh, unsolicited hugs uh, from other Brazilians, uh, uh, other than that, yeah, that's it's pretty good. Oh, people think I know how to play soccer too for some reason, oh. which I do not. I do not. I can play soccer to save my life. Pedro, you're the worst Brazilian in the world. But I'll, I'll sometimes pretend that I know about soccer more than I do. <laughs> I feel like I'm very bad Brazilian sometimes. Uh, bad, at, bad at being Brazilian. Uh, and <laughs> so. By Corinthians. That's a soccer thing. Uh, uh, um, so, um, um, thanks, Pedro. Uh, Marcus says. Oh, people are asking me to turn my lights on, and I, I do agree. Yeah. Oh, you do look like you're uh, uh, you're getting launched into space. Um, 
Thank you. Not, way less creepy now. A little, a little less creepy. Uh, crispy. That's what I said, crispy. Um, so Marcus uh, says, if it's okay, um, could you talk about some visa challenges you encountered and then any advice to over uh, to uh, um, you said any yeah. advice? Well, visas are a bitch. So I was very lucky that when, when me and Mark got the offer to come to Disney, Disney offered to take care of my visa with their Disney lawyers. So that was very lucky. I didn't, I didn't really have to worry that much about it other than like, you know, being super scared of not getting a visa. Uh, but, you know, I just had to like send all my documentation. I had an O1 visa, which is a visa for uh, like artistic talents. So I had to find every single piece of like article or publication online that like mentioned my name and mentioned Cupcake yeah. and Dino. Yeah. So you know, like all these things like coming here and all that stuff happened like after 10 years of my career. But I, I literally, <laughs> I literally had like, you know, three shows, uh, two shows were out, one show was in production, and a fourth show was about to start production because because there's a fourth show in Brazil, which is a preschool show that I created that they're doing over there. Uh, so, you know, like I was, I was way like, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't just starting my career. It took me over 10 years. Uh, so, so, you know, like be, be patient sometimes, you know, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's frustrating. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's, you just get, give it some time and, and grow in your career. Don't be afraid to grow in your career in Brazil. Like there's, there's room to grow, there's work to do, there's freelance work. Now with COVID, like, People are hiring uh, artists from everywhere. So, you know, and I know many Brazilians who are living in Brazil and working freelance and crazy talented people. And the good thing is you get paid in dollars usually and, and the dollars are really expensive in Brazil right now. So mm -hmm. you make some good money. Uh, but yeah, visas suck. Visas suck and uh, if you look for a lawyer, like an immigration lawyer, if you can afford one, uh, that helps and they'll give you some guidance. I, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. No, I wouldn't dare. Uh, there's one idea here, as uh, which is always shows up in these, in these talks, which is uh, how's your process to pitch ideas, and what is your advice to people who want to pitch their own series? Uh, and I, I can talk about that if we, we have time. Yeah, of course, man. It's up to you. Uh, so I don't okay. have anywhere to be. Except to, nope, nope, nowhere to be. <laughs> so, uh, so if you want to make your own pitch, I think don't worry about producers and clients and that kind of stuff or how much money you're gonna make. Like, please, please don't, don't worry about that. Just worry about getting good at making pitches and making show ideas. So. The most common mistake I see people uh, doing is they'll do one pitch and that's it. They're like, oh yeah, I've created this pitch. It's, it's the greatest idea the world has ever seen. And that's your one idea and you're gonna spend like, and maybe that idea will sell, but from experience, more likely it's not gonna sell. So, but you're gonna hold on to that idea for 10 years, uh, people are gonna pass on it and you're gonna blame everyone else except yourself. And you're gonna be like, people don't realize how great an idea I have. Uh, so right. Right. making pitches and making shows, it's just like any other skill. It's like playing the piano. The first time you sit at a piano, you're probably gonna suck. You're not gonna start playing like crazy. So do your first pitch. And the first thing you should do after you finish your first pitch is do your second pitch. And then do your third and do your fourth and do your fifth. And then go back to the first one with all the experience you got along the way and, you know, reevaluate the first one and make it better and then make the second one better, make the third one better, then make a sixth one, then make a seventh one and start filling up that drawer with, with ideas. One, it will make it better. Uh, practice makes better, period. And two, it's good to have a lot of ideas in your drawer because when you're pitching to someone, you're like, oh, I have this like goofy buddy comedy 
and they're like, oh man, no, we kind of want like a mystery comedy show. And you're like, oh, wait a second, boom, I got this one too. So uh, don't worry about like, like making like, for example, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm, I'm animating like an 11 minute pilot at home for my pitch. Don't worry about that stuff. Make a, all my pitches, all my life has always been like a PDF document with drawings and text and nothing like there's no like 11 minute episode I, I animated by myself because it's important to leave room for the imagination. So, right. so if you, if you make a, your pilot episode by yourself, chances are it's not going to be the same quality as the finished show would be. So, uh, if, if you make a PDF with drawings and text, you're, the, the show is playing on the person's head. The person who's listening to the pitch, they're imagining the show in their head. They're imagining your drawings moving beautifully. So if you can't make your drawings move beautifully, do not put that image of the half-baked show in that person's head. Right. Just make beautiful drawings, beautiful PDF pitch document, and make it personal. Uh, one thing that me and Mark learned along the way and when we pitched to Disney, we pitched five different show ideas. All of them, the last page was, uh, the, 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 the name of the last page was why it matters to us. And we yeah. explained in like a couple of paragraphs why that idea connected to us personally mm -hmm. and why it was important to us mm -hmm. and why we are the only people who can make that idea the way that we want to make it. Yeah. Because, you know, like, and it can be like, oh, this idea is about my childhood or this idea is about, you know, this, this weird aunt that I had and I had to like sometimes spend uh, summers in her house and it was weird, uh, you know, make it personal. No matter how fantastical the idea is, uh, you're, you're pitching, when you're pitching a show, you're pitching yourself too as a creator, as, a, as an artistic voice. So you want to make sure you tell them why your artistic voice is unique. Uh, and don't be scared about people like, and that's why I'm never scared about like people stealing ideas and stuff. Like I, I'll show my ideas to as many people like as I can, because what makes the idea unique is you and your storytelling point of view. Like anyone can make a show about a kid and a dog uh, and a sword, but only Penn Ward can make Adventure Time. Right. So it's not like the sum of the, the show is more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, just keep keep doing, keep doing more more and more pitches, and and make it character based, make strong characters, do not just focus on the world and the story to, and the and the lore, and you know whatever magic stones got broken into five parts and scattered across the kingdom and blah blah blah, because in the end you're making a show with characters and people are following the characters. It, it, you're not you're not making like an encyclopedia or a history book for a world. So you know make strong characters and build the world around the character. Everything in the world needs to service those, char those characters and those character conflicts. Even the secondary characters, they exist to serve your main character. So if they don't bring anything new to, to your main character, it probably shouldn't exist in the show. Like if, you're, if, you've, if you've been pitching something and you're describing the world for like 10 minutes and you haven't even talked about your main character, then probably that stuff does not belong in the show. Like everything needs to service the character. Right. So, right. yeah, that's kind of my broad strokes of great. like how how I would do a pitch. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, I learned. I, that's great, man. Uh, I I was trying to think of questions on that, but like you answered all the questions of. Uh, and uh, really quickly, uh, like in that initial pitch, Pedro, if you don't mind me asking, per project. This is this is kind of it might be a trivial question but it says a lot about kind of how people structure their um and format their pitches but like per project like five minutes ten minutes uh i mean it depends on the room you're going into like I, the room. Yeah. yeah i think like like sometimes uh you know like i said those events that that you go to where like you know those markets like kids screen sure. uh sometimes like you usually have like 15 minutes to Tell, tell a pitch. Yeah, it, it's yeah. like you have 50, you have like 20 minutes to yeah. like introduce yourself, tell sure. tell them who you are and where you come from, and then tell yeah. the pitch. So try yeah, try to make your pitch like Thanks. usually like like 10, 15 minutes. If you're going for like a big meeting and you have one the one pitch you're presenting and you have a lot of material and then they're sure. all there to see that one pitch, then sure. sure you can make it like half an hour. You can sing and dance and do whatever. But uh, 
on the case of Disney, for example, we they they told because Mark Mark went for a meeting at Disney and and they happened to be big fans of Cupcake and Dino and I was and I was in Rio I was in Brazil uh, working on Ollie's pack but I was working remotely as a VP uh, so so he came he came off the meeting at Disney and he was like he called me from the parking lot and he was like dude they're huge fans of Cupcake and Dino I told them we were gonna pitch some ideas buy a ticket to LA like for like the next month and we're gonna pitch stuff so oh, shit. What they asked, what they asked Mark and, and myself was like, do not bring like a super polished final like hundred page pitch. Bring us multiple ideas, and they can be kind of rough. So we made five ideas in like a month and a half um, to two months or something, and and we didn't make them like super crazy polished. Uh, and it was a great exercise of like being concise and being like really distilling a pitch down to its basic elements. So like you don't need to write like a hundred pages of stuff for your pitch. If you write two pages and they're great and they're well written and it makes sense and they everything relate everything functions like a Swiss clock, uh, like a Swiss watch, then it's way better. So uh, and because most I, I imagine most of the people who are on the chat here are visual artists and you know they think visually uh sometimes we let that the writing part kind of slip a little bit uh we Don't think let it slip. Visuals. so if you if you read a couple of like screenwriting books and stuff like that that gives you a huge advantage because most most artists most visual artists end up not reading anything or like being interested in storytelling so reading some screenwriting books is a huge advantage and super important if you want to create a show pitch because mm -hmm. the writing is what's gonna like you know it, it's it's at least half of it so yeah uh, oh it's i mean i half or more i mean especially in the initial stages yeah right? i only say that because um in the initial stages everybody understands that this is a this isn't the final art but this the writing will describe the tone of the show so I would even say, I mean, like, it might be 50-50, but writing might be 60-40, 70-30. Yeah. Only, only in terms of when you're pitching, you're pitching to um, development executives who are more in tune with the writing aspect of it. And they see um, brilliant artists every day. Um, so that's just the reality of it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think that... Yeah, because you know, there's so many people who have animated shows and pitch animation that are purely writers. So you can make a pitch that's just writing. Like, you can, you can't make a pitch that's just drawings. <laughs> so, uh, but I I think the drawing part sometimes can do a lot of the heavy lifting of like, you know, conveying a, conveying a personality, conveying a mood, conveying like you know a world and and how your characters relate. Uh, so it can do a lot of the heavy lifting, but you know your show is is it's writing so writing should not be overlooked in any way uh, someone asked for a recommendation uh the one book i'd really like is, is called the tv writer's workbook by uh alan sandler uh it's a really ugly cover but it's a lovely book on like sitcom writing so especially for comedy uh i think that's a pretty good book uh, i would recommend that i would recommend the master classes um, if you can afford them, I, I don't know how. I oh yeah, yeah. Right now. Uh, but there's there's kind of like um, uh, Shonda Rhimes and uh, sort of Aaron Sorkin is on there. Um, I'm sorry, what was that? Pedro what was the uh... Uh, the book is the the, the TV writer's workbook. Uh, someone recommended Story by Robert McKee. I think it's kind of a I think it's a book that kind of turned me off of writing because I was like <laughs> the first the first writing book that I read and it he just makes it so complicated and so many rules and stuff that I, I think like it's like when you're learning to animate for the first time and you go straight to like the the Richard Williams book. It's too much. Like you don't need like like X sheet and whatever and you shouldn't listen to music while you animate and blah blah blah. Like it's too much. I think that's kind of like a more like advanced book. Like, it's like, if you're learning to animate, go for like the Preston Blair book, which is like, oh, here's a walk cycle. It's like these five drawings. <laughs> uh, and, and I think the story is kind of the same way. Like it's a bit of an oppressive book. 
I, I, I go something simpler like uh, it, Dan Harmon has a, a if you if you Google Dan Harmon story circle he, oh, wrote, yeah. he wrote a piece about the story circle that's really cool and really interesting yeah. really concise it's like when I read it it was like oh everything is explained here like in a very simple way yep. it's, it's great uh, I would so, recommend reading the reading pilots as well. I, I that Shonda Rhimes masterclass thing. She's like, just read pilots and then compare them to the actual pilot and then go back and read the pilot. And, um, and, uh, yeah, those pilot scripts are gold. Uh, they're all out there. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, Tessa, if Tessa Dapney says, uh, could you go into your experience as a showrunner? Um, I'm interested in becoming a showrunner one day and would love to know the inner workings on the job. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think uh, we can okay. that too much. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right, so, sh so show showrunner's official title that does not exist. Like, <laughs> there's no credit like showrunner. It's like, if you're showrunner, you're usually like an executive producer on the right. show. Yeah. Uh, and don't ask me to explain what different executive and different producers do because it's, it's still a mystery to me. Yeah. Uh, but so as a showrunner, you're, you're, uh, you're kind of in charge of making sure that everyone is working together in a consistent way and that the vision is being respected. Uh, so it's sure. your job. Yeah. Well, the vision of the show, right? The vision of the show. Yeah. 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 So it's your job to be very, very clear on what the vision is and what the show is about and be you have to be the biggest expert on the show at all times like you you have to be able to answer questions about the show that sometimes are hard and sometimes like i don't want to think about this part of the show but you kind of gotta uh so you know you have to have that vision clear in your head and you have to be very clear about conveying that vision to other people because they they can't guess what's in your head and and it's about you know being that filter of like what belongs in the show, what doesn't belong in the show, uh, you know what direction should the show take, what kind of jokes and what kind of like what kind of designs belong in the show, uh, and and then surrounding yourself, like I said, surrounding yourself with people who are way better than you at at different different parts of the show, and just giving them room to shine and do their job, and giving them support to do their job. Don't steer them in the wrong direction. Give them clear, uh, give them clear direction so they so they can, they can they can be they can still be creative and they can still like you know put their imprint in the show. But they you got but they gotta be heading in the right direction. Like you gotta tell them what the what the path is and let them be creative and, and add and do their thing. But in in a path which is the same path that everyone should be going down. Uh, because if if you don't know how to 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 give them that direction, they they might go to a different path, and they're and they're just gonna be mad at you because they just wasted like a month of work because you weren't clear enough about what you wanted. Right. So yeah. so yeah, you gotta have a kind of a big vision of of the whole show and know what the show is and what what feels like the show and what doesn't feel like the show, and let people do their best. Let people just shine and bring, bring all their creativity to it. What was the hardest thing about uh, show running for you, uh, Pedro? Uh, Amongst the thousand hard things. <laughs> well, the hardest part was show running and directing at the same time. But uh, I mean, for me, it was uh, just kind of like, making sure I was giving people the resources that they needed and I was communicating things clearly, like that was a constant worry I had. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, making sure that you're giving them enough, but not drowning them with like directions and notes in a way that makes them feel stifled. Yeah. So that balance is really hard and something I'm still yeah. learning and I still make mistakes. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's kind of the hardest part for me which is, I think is the true challenge of just being like a showrunner is, yeah. is uh, you know, making sure you know what the show is, but making sure that people can bring their best to the show and giving that room to 
work and and also like the balance between not not drumming people with notes but also not like settling down for like ah oh, it's fine okay right so, right, like, right you know sometimes you're just tired and you're just like ah and yep. Mm -hmm. and not freaking out too much like on cupcake and dino it was i feel like by we did 52 episodes and i only felt comfortable by the time we got to episode like 22 or something like 23 which felt like you know like oh i i think like because the first season you know people always say the first season is part of development of the show because you're still figuring out what the show is so the first 20 something episodes, we were still figuring out and I was still figuring out what the show was. And by the time we got to 20 something, we felt like, okay, we know what the show is. The animators are doing a great job. The, you know, the character designers, everyone is just like firing on all cylinders. Let's go, go, go. And just like, you know, we, we, we feel like we got a good grasp of what the show is, but it takes like sometimes 20 something episodes. Man, I can imagine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I remember I went to Netflix to for to have lunch with uh, with Jorge Gutierrez, and I was already in awe of like this. I I didn't live here; I was like visiting LA. Yeah, and he was kind enough to invite me, yeah. and I was just like, oh my god! I was already yeah. like my mind was already blown. Yeah. And I yeah. sit at the table, and like yeah. next to us, Craig McCracken sits at the same table. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm like oh, I'm just like having a heart attack, yeah. and <laughs> and 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 Jorge. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Jorge introduced me to him and and he was and you know Craig McCracken was super nice and and I told him like yeah we have a show that's about to, it had the cupcake and I hadn't come out yet and the show was the 52 were split in two seasons so season one is about to premiere yeah and I was like we're premiering season one of cupcake and dino here on Netflix oh. I hope you like it but you know like the imposter syndrome talking you know you're always apologizing for your work and you're like but you know uh, I hope you like it, even though the first episodes aren't like, you know, the show is still finding itself, so it's not like, it's not great, like, the, you know, it's, we're getting there. And he looked at me, he's like, yeah, that's every first season I've ever done in my life, so yeah. don't worry about it. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, uh, yep. I mean, like, uh, like Jorge Gutierrez is, is uh, like a warrior in the animation industry. Like, I, uh, the first time I walked into that Netflix lunchroom, he's like sat me down and he was like, I'm surrounded by effing Glenn Keen and there's this person over here, that person. And he, and Jorge's like, saw, like, yeah. And I'm like, whoa. And then uh, Jorge Gutierrez leans into me and he's like, so tell me about your background, Pontius. How did you grow up? You grew up with a, how was your family? Oh, single mom? How was she? You know, and just the whole, I was like, what am I under? And just, just like, uh, it was the ultimate, uh, just kind of like perfect, uh, just there's a guy who wants to know about another guy sincerely, yeah. no matter what their, I don't know, their status or, or status in the industry is, but like he totally just kind of wanted to new, know who you were and you ever reach out to him and ask him to lunch and eat, and and he says yes, he'll do the same thing to you as well. While you're eating a fish taco, it'll be like, "What's your background?" And he's always looking for a story, or you know. That's why he's a good storyteller. He's just yeah. interested in people and, and their stories, and yeah, he's, so funny. he's literally like the nicest pe the nicest person I've ever met. He had no. I, I was like coming from Brazil. He had no obligation to like meet me or anything and and he knew i was coming to la i was like hey i'm coming to la and he's like oh come on, come on over have lunch on netflix with me like yeah. no he didn't need to do any of that stuff no he didn't need, need to do anything no yeah. yeah yeah and he's directing like a, a mini series so he's the busiest person on that crew but he'll still say come over for lunch and meet you for lunch and turn you around he'll just do that yeah He's the nicest person. <laughs> it's crazy. It's in insane. Um, and so I, I think we answered a little bit of this, and this could be your last question uh, before we head out. But uh, Mahima uh, Pundir um, says, do you ever have feelings of insecurity or felt discouraged towards anything, um, towards any of your college or junior 
but I'm just going to interpret that as like anything that you do. And if so, how do you overcome it? Um, we talked, we touched on it a little bit, but um, I'm sure we can yeah. sort of. I mean, you're, you're going to be surrounded with crazy talented people <laughs> if you're working in this industry. Yeah. So try, you know, that's what we talked about. Everyone having their own journey, like try not to compare yourself to them. Like the, the measure of success of your work is how far your work gets you and not looking like someone else's work or feeling like someone else's work or getting where someone else got. Like the measure of your success is yours. Your path is yours. And it's really hard. It's, I'm not saying I like it's easier said than done. It's really hard not to do that. I still go on Twitter and I see a billion beautiful drawings and I feel depressed <laughs> about, about my skills. And I see people like, you know, I see people like, oh, I'm announcing my new show. And I'm like, oh, and I'm like, I feel bad. And I feel like, you know, I feel jealous and I feel terrible feelings. And I'm like, I have four shows that have been greenlit and I still feel that way. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't use, use other people as measuring stick. Just, yeah, make sure your journey is yours, belongs to you and you know, try to try to help as many people as possible along the way when you can, because this karma is, is great when it's good. Uh, you know, right, rise up is amazing for that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, reach out to people, talk to people, maybe be be like honest about it. If if someone is making you feel insecure, you just maybe talk to them about it, like. Unless they're fit, unless they're making you feel insecure, not because of their art, or if they're making you feel insecure because they're harassing you or something, then you should, <laughs> you should go talk to your supervisor or your director or, or HR, please, to not like take that silently. All right, man. So, um, Pedro, what are our plans? How are we going to tackle 2020? Um, I'll start it out. I'm going to try to um, continue forward um, with my personal stuff. Uh, and I'll try to continue forward with Rise Up stuff um, and make a commitment to everybody out there. What do you think, Pedro? What's your, what's your, what's your 2020 goals from here on out? Uh, yeah, I, I want to try to reach out more to the community. And, you know, like, like now I feel like I am truly in a place of privilege, like being here and working at Disney, having a steady salary to, to work on you know just doing what I love so I, I definitely continue with rise up I've, I've been away for like the past couple of weeks oh it's okay because work's been pretty crazy yeah uh, uh, but also you know like uh, trying to try and elevate Brazilian voices and Brazilian artists yeah I've been, trying, I've been trying to get together people in Brazil and I've been I've been doing that for like the last few months of like yeah uh, like buying and donating uh, uh, tablets to people, to artists in Brazil who don't have it. Mm -hmm. These tablets can be really expensive in Brazil. So uh, I've been reaching out on Twitter and asking for, you know, artists who use, sometimes they'll draw on their phones or with their mouths and they have like amazing art, yeah. incredible. Mm -hmm. And trying to get tablets to them because, you know, with, especially with work from home, a lot of the artists depend on the tablets at the studio. And now they don't have a studio, they don't have a tablet at home and they can't work. So, you know, if you're Brazilian, you have a tablet just lying like somewhere in your, in your room and you're not using it, find someone on Twitter or Instagram who, who needs a tablet and donate it because it's, it's really important. Yeah. Uh, so I want to keep doing that. And uh, no, that's awesome. Man. Uh, yeah. I want to keep working on my mental health. Yeah. It's, these, time, these times are super hard. So it's been hard for everybody. Don't, don't, don't demand stuff from yourself that you can, your brain can give you right now. So be kind to yourself and uh, try not to push yourself over a limit. Like this, I've, I've been like, because I think your first instinct once quarantine starts was like, oh, it's just normal, but from home. So, you know, like I still have my job, I'm still working. So it's just going to be business as usual, but I'm going to do it from home, but it's not. Mm -hmm. it's, it took me a few months to realize that I need to take care of my mental health. Mm -hmm. I need to be kinder to myself mm -hmm. and not, not expect yeah. the same thing that I would, that, you know, you would expect working in an office. 
you know, get some um, rest. Yeah, give you, give yourself a pass sometimes, and if you're if you didn't have a super productive day, that's fine. I, I'm yeah. someone who really like pushed myself for years and years and years to post a drawing every day on Instagram. And I, this whole quarantine, I've posted like three drawings and I, it was really bugging me in the beginning, but now I really don't care. Like, I think my mental health is more important than that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, one day the world will go back to normal, but take care of you, take care of myself and try to sell a show here because uh, I kind of want to, want to stay. Uh, I have, a, I'm lucky to have an amazing, glorious, awesome partner here who uh, is the most important person in the world to me. And, uh, and, uh, I want to keep doing what I'm doing here and yeah. work in this amazing community and make sure that my voice is heard here too. Yeah. Awesome. Represent, represent for Brazil. Um, represent for hard workers everywhere. <laughs> represent for workers uh, working in quarantine, but uh, that's awesome. Man. That's and I want this quarantine to end so I can visit Brazil and see my family and my friends there because Yo. I miss those guys a lot too. Yeah, Tito Ben. I don't know what that means, but that's fine. Um, what does that mean, Tito Ben? Tito Ben. Oh, someone someone said wear your mask. Yes, wear your mask. Wear your mask. Wear your mask. Wear more masks. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, we'll end on that. Uh, Pedro, thank you so much. Guys, uh, thank you for being a part of it. Uh, Pedro, this was fun. Uh, oh my God, this was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, right? it was fun. I mean, it's not as nerve wracking as it seems to be. We, we were kicking it. We we're having a drink at a bar. Yeah, and all we yeah. missing is the beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's get a beer, let's get a beer. Uh, but uh, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Pedro. I uh, thank you for every and thank you to everybody coming around from the world. At some point, we had like you know like two hundred fifty people in here, and uh, but uh, yeah, some are eighteen, so you guys can drink. But um, but thank you guys for coming. We always appreciate your presence and and appreciate your questions. And um, thank you guys for being a part of the conversation, um, Pedro. This is amazing. I hope to see you again. Sometime yeah. in person soon, my brother. Um, yes. You are truly inspiring. I love your work. I love your approach to everything storytelling, and I really envy your skills and and your and oh, everything about. Uh, and I learned a lot about pitching tonight too, as well. So that'll really help me a lot. Uh, Man, I, I'm crazy inspired by your work, and and don't say it. And not like your artistic artistic work, but of course, because you're like an uncanny, incredible artist, but also the work you're doing with Rise Up, it's just like truly amazing and truly touching. And it really like changed my, my outlook on, on the industry and, and, what, and what I should be doing and what I should be focusing on. Like for real, I'm not exaggerating. And thank you so much. Like, like I can't believe you stuck around and all these people stuck around for like two hours. It's crazy. Uh, thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Rise Up. Thank, thank you, you for everyone who's who's collaborating with Rise Up, from the mentors to the mentees. This is like a beautiful, beautiful, like like industry changing thing. You're very um, good. So here, hold on, hold on. Get, uh, bring it in. Bring it in. Bring it in. Virtual hug. Oh God. Oh man, you are warm. Yes, I got. I got. I'm, I'm very sweaty. It's really hot. God. Wow. I got a lot of BO, so Woo! I'm glad this is a virtual hug for you. Man, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was the most physical contact I've had in uh, six months. Uh, but uh, that's awesome, man. Thank you so much again. Thank and you, buddy. Bye, everybody. Take bye, care. Everybody. Pedro, bye, Pedro, bye, Pedro bye, Brazil in the Belarus Brazil. Foundation. Brazil. Oh! Woo! Brazil, porra! Valeu, galera. What he said. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye, I'll see you soon, man. See you.